Um, I'm Arevan Toho of the Energy Social Mission. Um, thank you for coming to the 100th anniversary lecture series. Um, please enjoy the lecture. Now, Mr. Kurashige takes over the prize. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Toho Sensei. Uh, Kojima Sensei is not here today. So um, thank you, Toho Sensei, for welcoming everybody in his place. Uh, we're on the June event for our 100th anniversary series for Zenchuji's Zen uh, anniversary. And this is a really special event for me because my background is in Jodo Shinchu Buddhism, growing up at Venice Honganji here in Los Angeles. Um, and have since uh, combined Jodo Shinshu with Zen. And I find that really intriguing. And so this event clearly was, was something I was very interested in. And so we have three wonderful guests here, um, Ito Sensei, Harada Sensei, and then my colleague at USC, Duncan Williams. Um, and let me introduce them all right now. And first we're gonna have Ito Sensei come and talk about the Zen Shin, whatever that means to him, um, for around 20, 25 minutes. And then Harada Sensei will come and speak uh, about the same theme. And then uh, after that, we're gonna have a conversation between uh, the two senseis and, and Duncan Williams. So let me introduce first, uh, Rinban Noriaki Ito. Ito Sensei was born in Kumamoto, Japan. He came to the U.S. with his family, Reverend Hoyu and Kazuko Ito. Uh, he grew up in Boyle Heights, which is about a mile or two just east of here. Some of our, our members here at Zen Shuji are from Boyle Heights. Um, Amy, who gave the talk last, last month. Um, graduated from Roosevelt High. I don't know if that still gets a, an applause. Yes, that gets an applause. <laughs> you have a fan from Roosevelt High. Uh, and then went to Occidental College, uh, not far away. Um, and got a BA in Religious Studies uh, with a minor in Asian Studies. He then studied at Otani University in Kyoto and received an MA in Shin Buddhism. Otani Sensei, as you know, is the head uh, university, the main university for the Higashi Honganji. He served as a full-time minister at Higashi Honganji here in Los Angeles, just a few blocks away. Uh, here in Little Tokyo, and then later at West Kobina, Higashi Honganji, and then returned back to the LA Betsuin as Rinban, the head minister of the regional headquarters temple. He, he now serves concurrently as director or bishop of the Higashi Honganji North America District and of the Shinshu Center of America. Okay, our second speaker today is Reverend Marvin Harada. Born in Ontario, Oregon, and grew up on a family farm in Eastern Oregon, he attended the Idaho, Oregon Buddhist Temple. Uh, he received a BA in Religious Studies at University of Oregon, um, MA in Buddhist Studies uh, at the Institute of Buddhist Studies in Berkeley. After that, he studied under Reverend Gyome Kubose at the Buddhist Temple of Chicago, and then studied for five years in Kyoto and received an MA at uh, Ryukoku University, the head university, the main university for the Nishi Honganji, uh, and then attended, also attended Chuo Bukyo Gakui. We had just talked about uh, learning Japanese <laughs> together and being uh, you know, in, in Kyoto as a Japanese American. Uh, Harada Sensei served as minister at OCBC, Orange County Buddhist Church, from 1986 to recently, 2020, and since then has been Bishop of the Buddhist Churches of America. Uh, our third guest is going to moderate the conversation. Uh, Duncan Williams uh, is, uh, was ordained as a Soto Zen priest at Kotakuji Temple in Nagano, Japan, and then served as Buddhist chaplain uh, at Harvard University, where he received his PhD in 2000. Currently, he's chair of USC's School of Religion and professor of American Studies and Ethnicity and director of USC's Shinto Ito Center for Japanese Religions and Cultures. Uh, Duncan is the author of the LA Times bestseller, American Sutra, A Story of Faith and Freedom in the Second World War. And for our first lecture in the series, Duncan spoke about that book and spoke about the internment of Japanese Americans. Uh, he's also 
the co-curator curator of Sutra and Bible, Faith and the World War II Japanese American Incarceration, which is currently an exhibit being held at JANUM, Japanese American National Museum here in Little Tokyo. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ito-sensei, um, and then we'll move on to Harada-sensei and then the conversation. Can I sit down or? Uh, why don't you, yes, if you want to sit down, go ahead. Let me just get my chair and I'll make sure we get that right. Yes. <laughs> so I, uh, I have uh, 20 minutes. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, offer uh, congratulations to Zen Shuji. Uh, uh, for the uh, centennial celebration. Um, you know, and I'm very grateful for having this opportunity to share this uh, occasion with you. And uh, this evening, you know, it's a chance to look at two of the major uh, Buddhist traditions that developed in Japan, uh, Zen and Shin. And of course, you know, all of the Japanese Buddhism came from, um, from India and China, uh, but these two traditions can be said uh, to be among, uh, well, among the most influential of all of the uh, denominations that are in Japan. Um, as uh, Lon mentioned, I grew up in Los Angeles. I came, uh, I was actually born in Japan uh, in 1948, and uh, my father uh, was a minister, and he was asked to come to take over the uh, Los Angeles Higashi Honganji here. And uh, so he came by himself in 1953, and then a couple of years later, uh, he decided, well, his intent was that he would come, serve for two or three years, and then go back to his uh, uh, temple in Japan. But then uh, within you know, two years, he realized that he couldn't uh, leave the Los Angeles temple that quickly. And so he decided to call uh, us to join him. So my mother, my two sisters, uh, we came in 1955. And I was uh, six years old when I came. And uh, I, you know, went to uh, uh, first first grade, uh, 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 first street school in uh, Boyle Heights, and I remember, you know, I couldn't speak any in any Jap I mean, English. And uh, I, I apparently, my mom told me that uh, I used to come home every day and, and complain about my teacher. And she and I said, what, what was I complaining about? And she says, you you said that your teacher uh, said your name backwards. It's like, you know, in Japan, it's like, I would be Ito Noriaki, but in this, you know, in public school here, they're calling me Noriaki Ito. I said, that's wrong. <laughs> but anyway, you know, but I quickly assimilated and uh, quickly learned English. And uh, one of the things, though, that I remember thinking about is, especially by the time that I was, like, in high school, uh, you know, I started thinking about what I might want to do with the rest of my life. And uh, one, you know, if we were in Japan, then uh, it's, you know, it's a family temple. So it's the Ito temple. And so uh, me being the older son uh, would have taken over basically automatically. But since we came to the United States and the, our temples here aren't run that way, uh, when a minister retires, then a, another minister usually in those days anyways is sent from Japan. And uh, so there was no obligation for me to take over. And, uh, and then my father never mentioned it, and so I just kind of figured, well, you know, I have freedom to, to go on and do, what, do what, what I want to do. And, uh, you know, as mentioned, I uh, decided to go to a small college. Uh, I went to Occidental. And uh, it was one of those things where, you know, you grew up in East L.A., and you're with, like, uh, a lot, there were a lot of uh, Japanese Americans there. There are also Mexican Americans and uh, a few like uh, Chinese Americans also. But it was basically a uh, what would you call it? Um, you know, uh, uh, immigrant kind of uh, uh, community. And uh, uh, anyways, you know, so I, when I went to Occidental, it was like it was like a completely different experience, and it, it, I felt as though I was. Uh, entering America for the first time in my life. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, you know, I, uh, I didn't know what I was going to do, and I started out in political science. 
kind of thinking, well, maybe I could become a lawyer. <laughs> and then I thought, well, no, this doesn't fit me very well. And so I said, did I do it well in high school? I said, well, math, you know, I was pretty good at math. And so I changed over to a mathematics major. And then I found out that college math is completely different from <laughs> high school math. <laughs> and so then I thought, I need something a little bit simpler. And so I actually uh, went, uh, went into econ, economics. And I took one course in economics, uh, it was a session. There were only three students and one teacher, or one professor. And so you had to, you know, look like you were learning something. And it was like the most boring subject I could think of. <laughs> and uh, so I decided that that wasn't uh, the direction for me to go in. And it just happened that in the uh, second term of the, uh, my junior year, I had a free, free, free uh, space. And there was this course being taught by uh, the uh, head of the religious department, a uh, religious studies department. And he was teaching a course on introduction to uh, religion, East and West. So I thought, well, maybe I'll take the course and see what, that, what it's like. And it was, uh, the professor was uh, Dr. Franklin Jocelyn. And uh, so I take this course and he starts in Hinduism and it's pretty interesting. And then he gets into Buddhism and, it, and it's really interesting. And I'm thinking, boy, you know, this, I, I never really thought about Buddhism in this way. And then I, you know, took, took the class. And then uh, after I finished, I, uh, uh, well, after the course finished anyway, I went up to Dr. Johnson and I said, you know, is there a way I can uh, uh, switch over to religious studies? And I was already like in the middle of my uh, junior year. So he says, well, if, you took all, if you've already taken all of your four, four classes, then you should be able to graduate in religious studies. And so that's what I did. And then after that, I, every course I took was uh, on religion. And uh, uh, so I started to finally you know, develop uh, an interest, a keen interest in Buddhism. And uh, this was like in 1970. And so it was a time when uh, Buddhism was becoming more and more popular. Uh, Zen Buddhism, especially, people were meditating. And, you know, and uh, so the students, you know, as, uh, as students, we would have meditation sessions and things like that. And uh, so I started to, you know, so I start, started to learn more, more about Zen, Zen than, you know, any other type of Buddhism. Well, of course, like primitive Buddhism, the Buddhism of Shakyamuni Buddha and so forth. But, um, so then, uh, as I was, uh, you know, so I took all these courses and I was getting ready to graduate. And uh, it was, uh, uh, well, it was a year that they started the uh, lottery system uh, for, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, serve as uh, soldiers in Vietnam. And so Dr. Jocelyn, one day he comes up to me and says, uh, Nori, you know, you don't want to go to Vietnam and have to fight against other Buddhists. And so you need to find a way to, uh, you know, get a deferment uh, so that you don't get drafted. And then he says, the best way would be if you continue it, your education. And what I suggest to you is that you go to Japan. And then if you go to Japan and get into a grad school uh, in, in, uh, in Japan, then you'll probably, you'll, you know, you'll probably be there for at least two or three, four years. And by that time, maybe the war will be over. And so, you, you know, you'll be safe. And so uh, I started thinking about that. Uh, one of my other uh, friends, uh, you know, we decided that uh, we would go to Japan and then uh, we were uh, accepted by uh, Otani University, which is the uh, uh, college, the official college of our Higashi Wangwanji tradition. And we went and then, uh, uh, you know, but we didn't speak any Japanese or very little Japanese. And so it was uh, really a, uh, it's, you know, uh, difficult for us to, uh, to learn anything, but uh, at any rate, um, uh, you know, this was, I forgot to mention that Dr. Jocelyn uh, was, you know, he was a former Presbyterian minister, so he was Christian, but then he was a student uh, at Columbia of uh, uh, this uh, professor by the name of Paul Tillich, and some of you may have heard of Paul Tillich, uh, a, a kind of a revolutionary Christian who, um, with some other uh, other uh, fellow, uh, you know, students, they they started to reinterpret Christianity, and uh, it was kind of like you know they would instead of uh, thinking of a God like up in the heavens, you know, they would talk about God as the ultimate reality, or the ground of our being, 
you know, and and uh, so then Dr. Jocelyn, you know, had kind of mentioned those kinds of things and, and said that maybe you can consider Shin Buddhism, you know, the, the Buddhism of Amida, uh, Amida Buddha, in the same way that we, uh, you know, new theists consider God. And so that was a really uh, helpful kind of, uh, in, you know, uh, lesson that I received. And, uh, you know, so then I was able to uh, uh, enter, enter a master's program and uh, was able to complete it. And in Blackstreet, it took me three years instead of two. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, you know, I uh, was able to do that. And even though I wasn't, when I first went to Japan with uh, Wei Nyokoyama, I, I wasn't thinking about becoming a priest. And I was thinking, well, maybe I could get a, you know, position teaching somewhere. But then I found out that, uh, you know, in order to teach, you really need a PhD. And, uh, and you know, I just didn't think that I had the, you know, the, the smarts to be able to, to uh, complete a PhD. And so then I started thinking about the ministry. And, uh, you know, so I, and, and, you know, I met a lot of uh, wonderful um uh, priests, ministers uh, in Japan, uh, whether it was at the college, because many of the professors were, you know, both uh, academics as well as ministers, and then also, you know, at the Honzan, at our mother temple. And uh, these are people who, uh, you know, you could tell were very devoted to their, to their, you know, to their, to their uh, role as a minister and teaching Buddhism. But at the same time, they were able to kind of separate their uh, personal life from their, you know, uh, from their life as ministers. And, uh, well, one of the things is like, uh, you know, when I was a student there, uh, first, I took after my mother, who was to almost totally, uh, what do you call it, uh, to 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 totally a person who couldn't uh, even take a sip of, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, uh, wine or anything. Yeah. And my father, he was a drinker, and he pretty much <laughs> drank every day, every night, and he used to come from Boyle Heights to Little Tokyo to the small bars here, uh, along with Nishihonganji ministers, and they would drink every night. And she said, you know, the one thing I was grateful for is that he never got into an accident and never got, not, never got caught by the police, <laughs> but he was always pretty much, you know, well, you know, what do you call it? Uh, anyways, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, so then, you know, when I went to Japan, uh, there were a lot of ministers who uh, took me under their wings, and then, then they said, uh, Nori, you know, you can't become a good Jodo Shinshu minister if you can't drink. <laughs> so I think, Marvin, you can't drink. <laughs> so, at any rate, you know, that, that was kind of the uh, uh, experience that I had. And uh, I uh, was, you know, uh, when, when I started studying Buddhism, I was much more interested in Zen, as I mentioned before. And I was, you know, uh, trying to uh, meditate and things like that. But then, whether it was Dr. Jocelyn or whether it's my, you know, my uh, teachers in Japan, uh, they told me that, you know, uh, you can, you know, sit in meditation and things like that, but you're, you're uh, from a, a Shin background and therefore, you know, you really need to study Shin, Shin Buddhism. And uh, so that's kind of like what I did. And, uh, you know, and, and so for so many years, I've had the opportunity to study both traditions and to have an appreciation for both Shin and Zen. And I remember, you know, learning so much from uh, the former Bishop Ken Koyamashita, who was our leader, uh, the leader of our Buddhist Federation for many, many years. And, uh, you know, sometimes I would come and he'd invite me into the office and serve me a cup of tea and things like that. And uh, there was a time, uh, well, let's see, uh, well, there was a time around 1988 that I was, ser I was asked to serve as the Buddhist advisor for uh, Occidental College for the students there. And I did that for about 20 years. I go every Wednesday at five o'clock and then we'd uh, uh, sit for 20 minutes. So, so actually I had like Reverend Kojima come to teach us how to sit properly. And uh, so 20 minutes we'd sit and then 20 minutes maybe I'd give a talk and then the last 20 minutes uh, we'd have a discussion. And this went on, you know, uh, and, and, and even today, uh, I, I don't go anymore, but one of my associates, Reverend uh, Miyoshi, uh, she's been going to Occidental. And uh, I, I remember, you know, men, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, Shin, Shin tradition basically reminds us 
um, that well, I didn't say this, but uh, they, it reminds us that we don't really have the tools uh, to enlighten ourselves. And uh, I remember one conversation that I had with Bishop Yamashita. Um, I started out by saying how much I admire uh, serious students in Zen spending a good part of their time in meditation. And so I asked him, uh, if a person was to meditate diligently every day, how many years would it take for him or her to attain enlightenment? And then he said, well, after so many years of practice, the realization that comes to that person is that we cannot enlighten ourselves. And so then, you know, I was thinking, well, that's basically kind of like how we in Shin, you know, Buddhism think too, you know, we, we can learn the, the teachings, we can, you know, uh, practice uh, uh, reciting Amida's name and so forth, but that's, that doesn't guarantee that we're going to be enlightened. And, uh, you know, reading the sutras is always important, uh, doing good deeds and, all, and so forth. But Shinran, uh, the, the so-called founder of the, of the Jolo Shinshu uh, tradition, uh, studied and trained at a monastery on Mount Hie in Kyoto. Uh, and the, that monastery is still there. And eventually, you know, after 20 years of training and studying there, uh, he left basically uh, regarding himself as a failure or uh, not, a, you know, a person who is incapable of enlightening himself. But also, you know, possibly doubting those paths that supposedly can lead, to, lead someone to become enlightened and become a Buddha. And Shindan eventually, you know, after leaving, was well, spending 20 years on the monastery, uh, he leaves and he, 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 you know, and then he eventually uh, is able to uh, meet uh, Honan Shonin, who became his main teacher and who founded the Jodo Shu tradition. And uh, Honan was practicing, you know, the Pure Land form of Buddhism and engaging in the practice of uh, reciting the Nambutsu, Namo Amida Butsu, calling the name of Amida Buddha, uh, the Buddha of the Pure Land. Uh, for Honan and for Jodoshu, which also is one of the largest uh, denominations in Buddhism, uh, the recitation of Nambutsu, Namo Amida Butsu, is their practice. And I think it was said uh, that Honan, you know, recited the Nambutsu something like over 10,000 times a day. You know? And uh, the big difference between the tradition of Jodo Shu and Jodo Shinshu, uh, which grew out of Shindan Shonin, is that the recitation of the Nambutsu was a practice like Zazen or other traditional practices. But Shindan came to the conclusion that he's, some, he's, uh, he's he is a simple, ordinary person and is incapable of any of the difficult to master practices of traditional Buddhism, like Zazen. And Shindan, of course, you know, recited the Nambutsu, but it wasn't a practice in the traditional sense of repetition, of focus, and so forth. Shindan's reasoning and understanding was that if the Nembutsu, Namu Amida Butsu, I, I take refuge in Amida Buddha, is recited with heartfelt conviction, then one sincere and genuine recitation can lead to Shinjin or to awakening. Uh, for us, though, you know, the most important thing that we can do is uh, self examination. Uh, Shindan, you know, used the term uh, to refer to himself, uh, the term Bongu. And Bongu is, uh, you know, basically we translate it as an ordinary being, a totally self-centered person. And he, that, that was the, the term that he used to refer to himself. Um, as with all traditions of Buddhism, you know, controlling the ego is the most important goal. Uh, we are basically self-centered beings. Uh, we think that we're right most of the time. We tend to think that we're better than others. So all, of, all, all schools of Buddhism have, have methods to try to suppress that kind of superiority complex, uh, the attitude that I, I know better than someone else. Uh, one such attitude, I think, is incorporated in a quote, a quote uh, from Jack Kornfield, uh, who, is a, who is a Vipassana Buddha, uh, Buddhist. And uh, he said, imagine that every person in the world is enlightened but you, they are all your teachers, each doing just the right things to help you learn perfect patience, perfect wisdom, perfect compassion. But I think, you know, Shindan goes further in that direction than any others. Uh, in a book, 
in a book that we uh, that uh, we we have uh, one of our key books called the Tanisho, uh, which is uh, trans well, the translation is uh, uh, let's see, uh, passages. Uh, uh, I can't remember. <laughs> At any rate, you know, the, the Tanisho is a very important book, and uh, Shindan is quoted with sayings that express his ordinariness. So, for instance, in chapter two, I reply, oh, no, I really do not know whether the Nambutsu may be the cause for my birth in the Pure Land or the act that shall condemn me to hell. But I have nothing to regret, even if I should have been deceived by my teacher and saying the Nambutsu fall into hell. The reason is that if I were capable of realizing Buddhahood by other religious practices and yet fell into hell for saying the Nambutsu, I might have dire regrets for having been deceased, deceived. But since I am absolutely incapable of any religious practice, hell is my only home. Uh, one book that we put out uh, years ago, a uh, translation of articles written by uh, a, a teacher by the name of Shuichi Maida, uh, 20th century Buddhist, who was, uh, he, who was never ordained, but who was a very devout Shin Buddhist. Uh, in one, in one uh, chapter uh, called The Ignorant Person, it says, what is a Buddha, awakened one? He is an ignorant person. He knows he is uh, totally ignorant. He has awakened to his own ignorance. What is a deluded person? He thinks he knows something. He has not yet awakened to the fact that he knows nothing at all. But if a deluded person awakens to his ignorance, he is a Buddha. He can easily become a Buddha. And then another article uh, uh, in, from ch uh, chapter 12, uh, the conviction that all human beings are equal comes from the realization that one is the most evil person in the world. When I become the only evil person in the world, everyone else becomes a good person. I no longer have the luxury of judging others, calling some good and others evil. I form the conviction that all human beings are equal. Furthermore, in the third chapter of the Tanisho, we read the statement, even a good person attains birth in the Pure Land, how much more easily an evil person? These two words, evil person, are enough. We don't have to talk about the most evil person. I have maintained that the core of Shin Shinran's thought is in these terms, evil person and the most evil person. Now, as I think, of, think about them over and over again, I renew my conviction that the essence of Shindan's teaching is to be found in those terms, nowhere else. Um, well, see, I think my time is up, uh, but uh, perhaps I sh can share a couple of uh, some uh, poems that um, I, th I think, you know, really kind of uh, teach us about what, uh, what Shindan was trying to, to say. Um, here's one uh, called To Live, uh, and uh, this is a, a, an old, he's a, he, he's a lay person, but uh, a farmer, but he uh, uh, is a very devout uh, Shin Buddhist. Digging out a potato from my garden, I noticed the hundreds of ants scurrying back and forth, having had their home underground destroyed. An earthworm mo moved aimlessly after the disturbance of his home. To live is to create difficulties for so many others. Please forgive me. And then uh, just a couple more. Uh, one is, uh, uh, well, these two poems were written by a 18-year-old uh, uh, young girl way back in early 1900s. And the first one is called The Big Catch. And then the second one, Sakana, which is a uh, fish. Uh, in the warm glow of daybreak, I hear the fishermen shouting, a big catch, a big catch, a big catch of sardines. On the shore, a festival to enjoy. In the ocean, a funeral service of sardines for the tens of thousands of family and friends lost in the big catch. And then Sakana fish. I feel sorry for the fish in the ocean. Rice are cultivated carefully by farmers. Cows are taken care of by the ranchers. Even carp are given food to eat. But the fish in the ocean are left to fend, fend, for, fend for themselves. They do nothing to bother us humans, and yet they end up being eaten by me. I feel so sorry for the fish in the ocean. 
But so there's, there's you know, some of the, uh, these kinds of uh, simple poems which convey the, uh, the message of uh, Jobo Shinshu. And uh, uh, so it's basically, you know, Jobo Shinshu is a kind of an everyday person's uh, form of Buddhism. In other words, you don't have to enter a monastery, you don't have to become a minister, but anyone can become a Jobo Shinshu Buddhist. Okay, well, I think I've taken up all of my time, and so I'll like to turn it over to the Mark. Thank you so much. It was okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank Zen Shuji for their kind invitation to be a part of your, your lecture series. And like Reverend Ito, I'd like to extend my uh, congratulations to you on your centennial, uh, celebrating this entire year on your 100 years of history here in Little Tokyo uh, with the Zen Shuji. A uh, little bit of my background, uh, some of it is kind of similar to River Ito's. I grew up attending uh, a Shin Buddhist temple in Eastern Oregon. Uh, my father uh, was a farmer there, so I grew up on a family farm. I went to an elementary school that was like Little House on the Prairie <laughs> TV show. Uh, 25 students in the entire school, not just the one grade. So first grade through eighth grade, 25 students. So in my class, there were just two of us, myself and one other girl, uh, her name was Mary Lou Coleman. Easy to remember your classmate's name when you only have one classmate. So eight years, other students would come and go, but basically it was myself and Mary Lou Coleman for eight years. If we want to have a class reunion, I just call her up. Hey, you want to have a class reunion? No, let's not do it this year. Okay. Well, let's uh, Lon mentioned my academic background, but don't be too impressed because in the eighth grade, out of a class of two, I graduated salutatorian, <laughs> which is second highest in your class out of a class of two. So uh, going off to college, I started at Oregon State University, didn't really know what I wanted to be yet, majored in business, wasn't very interesting. Then I kind of got interested in Buddhism, uh, kind of partway through going to various sort of youth retreats. And then I thought, well, you know, maybe I'm more cut out, cut out to be a minister uh, than a farmer. You know, I, my dad worked from sunup to sundown. I would ask our, our, our reverend, what time do you get up in the morning, Sensei? <laughs> oh, nine o'clock. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a bit of career. <laughs> so I switched and went from Oregon State to the U University of Oregon, which is like going from UCLA to the USC, you know, <laughs> they're rivals. Uh, but went to University of Oregon and I took uh, classes in religious studies like Irvin Ito. Uh, they had a very small department then. There was only one professor who taught all the Eastern religion courses. So there would be courses like Buddhism, I mean, the religions of India. So we'd study Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, religions of China, Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism. Uh, but he was a specialist in Dogen. And when I first started taking classes there, I didn't even know who Dogen was. So that was my background, typical sort of YBA kid, young, young Buddhist the kid from uh, Shin Temple, I was, had more of like a Sunday school, Dharma school level of, of education. So this teacher, his name was uh, Heejin Kim. He wrote a book on Dogen called Dogen Kigen Mystical Realist. Uh, but his classes were, you know, fascinating, wonderful classes on Buddhism, uh, Eastern religion. And he would do sometimes some special classes just on Zen. And, and of course, I took everything that I could during that time at the University of Oregon. Uh, then I went on to uh, study at the Institute of Buddhist Studies, 
And that's our, we have a small school. The Buddhist Churches of America has a small school to train ministers. And so I attended there uh, for uh, uh, actually, what, three years, I think. And then uh, continued to, to read and study about Zen. I think the books on Zen resonated more with, more with me than the books on Shin Buddhism. There really wasn't that much excellent books on Shin Buddhism yet at that time. So uh, books like uh, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind by Shinyu Suzuki. Oh, that was a you know, wonderful book. So uh, I, I continued to read more and study more about Zen even uh, when I was studying at the Institute of Buddhist Studies. For my master's thesis, I wrote a comparative study of Dogen and Shinnan. It wasn't a very good paper, but uh, it was good to study you know, both, both uh, teachers, uh, Dogen and his life, and Shinnan Shoni and, and his life. I, I found Dogen's life really fascinating, especially the part where you know, he, he leaves Japan you know, at the risk of his life to go on a boat to go to China. They don't even know if they can come back, you know. I mean, it's really at the risk of your life to seek out a teacher. You know, he's going to China to seek out, you know, a true teacher. And when he gets to China, uh, he initially meets this, this monk uh, from uh, a monastery. And, you know, he's kind of talking to the monk. What do you do? Well, I'm the cook. And so Dogen thinks, oh, he's just a cook. You know, just to cook. You know, that, that was his first real sort of uh, awakening experience, I think, in China. That he came to find out this cook had a deeper understanding of the Dharma than, than he had. And so uh, then he meets his, his true teacher, uh, Ju Qing, and then goes back to you know, Japan and establishes a Heiji. So, you know, Dogen finds his true teacher in meeting Ju Qing, and Shinran finds his true teacher in meeting uh, Honen Shoni. So whether it's Zen, whether it's Shin, it's, it's so pivotal, so important to meet uh, teachers. I, I like to share a few things about some of the teachers in my life. Uh, at in addition to uh, Professor Kim at University of Oregon, at the Institute of Buddhist Studies, the director at that time was uh, Reverend Haruyoshi Kusada uh, from Japan. He was only about five feet one, maybe at the most. Tiny man, so dynamic, but also so humble. Maybe the most humble person I've ever known in my life. You know, the ultimate sort of epitome of, of humility. Uh, so we could say, I think, in our Shin tradition, he was a real person of the Nimbus. When we were at IBS, we would, as students, we would put on sort of retreats for young people, for high school students. And so we had this summer retreat, and it was in San Luis Obispo Temple, and there's kind of a hut in the back where the rest of us uh, counselors stayed, and Irma Kusada was already asleep in uh, one part of that hut. And one night we're sitting around, the rest of us are still up till late talking. And then someone said, Hey, I think Irma Kusada is talking in his sleep. Oh, what is he saying? You know, <laughs> this is our teacher. We're curious, what is Irma Kusada saying in his sleep? So we kind of snuck over there to, to see if we could hear what Irma Kusada was saying. To our astonishment, he's saying the nimbutsu in his sleep. He's fast asleep, and this nammanabhusammanabhusamma is coming out of his mouth, you know, so deep within his being that even fast asleep, he's saying the nimbutsu. You know, if I talk in my sleep, I'm afraid of what I might say. You know? <laughs> like the lines are, Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> Hey, did you know you said Jennifer? <laughs> but River Kusada, Nembutsu is coming out while he's fast asleep. So he was a, a, a tremendous teacher to study under. Then I was so impressed 
by Reverend Yome Kubose by his book, Everyday Suchness. As I said, I was trying to connect with Shin Buddhism, but uh, just it just almost seemed like like Christian Buddhism, sort of, <laughs> you know, Mida and being saved and go to the Pure Land. And what does this all, you know, really mean? And, and it wasn't until I heard Reverend Kubosa talk about Shin Buddhism that Shin Buddhism really kind of resonated. And he would say things like, you know, Amida Buddha represents that which we should become. Amida Buddha represents that which we should become. Amida Buddha is a symbol for, you know, wisdom and compassion, you know, the heart of the Dharma. So, in that sense, I, I think he was really speaking the truth. Amida Buddha does represent that which we should become. So, Raymond Kubose, uh, another instrumental teacher, I went to Chicago and I studied under him at his temple for about nine months. And then I went uh, on to Japan to study further and to get ordination in our uh, Nishihonganji tradition. So, in Japan, I uh, studied uh, under a professor by the name of uh, Professor Shigaraki. Takamaro Shigaraki, and uh, he was a tremendous teacher of Shin Buddhism. He was very unorthodox. The traditionalists were calling him heretical, and he received a lot of criticism from the traditional teachers. But Shigaraki Sensei was trying to make Shin Buddhism, you know, relevant for modern man. And he was, he's just trying to make it me. He says, if we keep teaching it this way, Who's going, to, who's going to follow this teaching? And, and that's what he was trying to say. Now, his efforts are, are, are being shown that he was really right. You know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, what he was trying to say, he was really right. Our Nishi Honganji has openly said to all of us ministers over here that they have 10,000 temples in Japan. Nishi Honganji has 10,000 temples. In the next 10 years, they expect to lose one third of their temples because of membership decline. And, and this is it's like, they don't know what to do. So what's Nishi Honganji doing? They're sending ministers over here to learn from what we're doing. But it's not like we're all that successful either. We've lost membership too. So we have challenges ahead of us. But Professor Shigeragi was trying to make Shin Buddhism, you know, relevant. And he would talk about people like Dogen in some of his lectures. You know how the, I think, what is the word expression? Shisho Ito, the enlightenment and the path are one, are one. And he, he would say, you have to be on the path. You have to be on the path of the Nimbutsu. I, I love Dogen's words, you know, to study Buddhism is to study the self. But we could say that that expresses the essence of Buddhism, whether it's Zen Buddhism, whether it's Shin Buddhism, any school of Buddhism. How, how much better can it be expressed? I know the quotation is, is longer than that, but you know, I just want to focus on that first part. To study Buddhism is to study the self. See, I, I was so fond of that expression that in our Orange County Buddhist Church service book, that we, we made a new service book. It's in the pews. We, in, we have a section of selected sayings you know, by Shinran Shoning and others. We put in that saying by Dogen. <laughs> to study Buddhism is to study the self. So next time I get invited here, I want to check your service book, and uh, I hope to see a quotation from Shinran Shoni in, in, in the Zen Shuji service book, maybe. But I'm just kidding. But really uh, uh, tremendous saying that, that all Buddhist schools could say is, is really the essence of Buddhism. But it's hard to live, live up to, isn't it? For my own Buddhist name, I, I thought this was such a key teaching to study the self. I chose for my, my Buddhist name, Kenji. Ken means to see. Ji means oneself, to, to see oneself. But I really should have chosen the characters Kenta, 
Ken meaning to see, Ta meaning others. <laughs> because that's probably how I live more than by living Kenji. It's so easy to see others, but it's hard to see ourselves. Just a humorous example. One time my wife and I went to a buffet restaurant. This is before COVID now. We went to a buffet restaurant. We're going through the line. And, and I'm noticing this lady ahead of me. She's just piling the food onto her plate. And I kind of whispered to my wife, look, look at all the food that lady took. I mean, a mountain of food. And on top of that, she puts a muffin. And, and then, so I'm kind of giggling to myself. And then I get back to my table. And I look down at my plate, and I've got a pile of food just as big as hers. Easy to see others, but very hard to see ourselves. Once after a service at uh, Orange County Blues Church, I was outside in front of the, the hondo there talking to people, and a member put his arm around me and said, Cynthia, I need to talk to you. And he pulled me off to the side. I thought, well... Maybe his personal issue, he wants some counseling or something. So he pulled me way off to the side where no one could see us. And he said, Sensei, your fly is down. <laughs> <laughs> my, my zipper was wide open. And I'm out there talking to people. He was so kind to pull me off. He didn't want to say there in front of me, oh, Sensei, your zipper is down. <laughs> he pulled me off to the side. Something so close to us, but yet we can't see it. How much more so things about my greed, anger, and ignorance that are so hard to see. So Dogen's words, so such a challenge for us. You know, to study Buddhism is to study the self. Don't you think that could even be words that Christianity, to, that Christians could follow by? To study the Bible is to study the self. I would think that would be tremendous teaching for for a Christian. That's why you're studying the Bible. That's why you're reading the Bible to, to understand you know, oneself and to be awakened to all things. So um, I'd also like to share uh, in our Shin Buddhist tradition, we have other wonderful teachers. Uh, maybe some of you have heard Reverend Tetsuo Unno. I'm sure he must have spoken here, uh, maybe not recently. Recently, he doesn't take speaking engagements, but uh, he's been a popular speaker at, at Shin temples, Nishi and Higashi, and, and other places as well. He studied Zen Buddhism deeply, Shin Buddhism deeply, Western philosophy, literature, psychology, and he draws from all of that when he talks about the Dharma. But he did a class for us in which it was on Zen Buddhism and Shin Buddhism. And he made uh, several sheets of quotations. And he didn't say who made the quotation, but he said it's either by a Zen master or by a Shin, Shin teacher, Shin minister or Shin layperson. And so the class was, we went through these quotations one by one, and he would read the quotation, and he would say, well, who do you think wrote this? Zen person or a Shin person? And we'd read it, oh, this sounds very self-power-like. So it must, be, it must be written by a Zen, Zen master. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it was written by a Shin Buddhist teacher. Huh? Then we'd go to the next passage and we'd read it. Oh, this sounds very other power expression. It has to be written by uh, a Shin Buddhist minister. Wrong. <laughs> this was written by a Zen master. So, on and on, every quotation, every quotation, we were dead wrong. So it's not so simple to characterize Zen as sort of self-power school and Shin as other power school. And over the years, I've heard that sort of simple uh, categorization, but usually it's from the Shin Buddhist side. And, and I think it's presented as if Shin Buddhism is superior to Zen. See, uh, well, uh, Zen is the self-power school, but we, <laughs> we are the other power tradition uh, as if that is, you know, superior. But when you, you get to the core of it, you know, I think all, the, all Buddhism has to be an other power awakening, 
right? Like Reverend Ito said, uh, Yamashita Sensei said, the more you practice, the more you realize you can't enlighten yourself. If you had that kind of power, then I might be able to say, hey, well, today, maybe about 6.30, that's a good time to enlighten myself. Maybe, <laughs> maybe this will be the day. Well, of course, that's absurd. It doesn't happen that way. But we're on the path, see? We're on the path, and where realization occurs, well, it might happen, it might not happen. There might be something that kind of builds over time. You know, we have some lay people, very devout, and, and that, that's what draws people to our sangha. It's more the lay people than, than me. I've had more people say, oh, no, I joined OCBC because I want to be around this lady, Sachi. Her name was Sachi. Such a devout, warm person. You know? And so that's sort of the strength of, I think, Shin Buddhism is, is a sangha that people are drawn to. Sangha that people feel uh, a sense of belonging, a, a sangha in which we're all on this path together of, of learning and listening to Dharma. So I think both Zen and Shin Buddhism, we have the same challenges in the future. You know, we're trying to share the Dharma with others. We're trying to share the Dharma with, with new people, how to reach new people. I mean, the need for the Dharma in, this, in our society, in the world today is, is so evident. I mean, just watch the evening news. Oh my gosh. It's just horrific sometimes, what we see on the news. And that's what gives me all the more, what, uh, reason to, to be a Buddhist and, and to be a minister. So I... I really hope Zen Shuji will flourish in this next hundred years. I hope Shin Buddhism will flourish in this next hundred years. And I have no doubt that it will. I have no doubt that Buddhism will. Someday, Buddhism will be the dominant religion of this culture. And, and the evidence is just the history of Buddhism. Whatever culture Buddhism has gone into in time, might take 200 years, 300 years, but it becomes this the major spiritual religious tradition of that culture. And so I have no doubt that it will be in this, in this country someday. I, I would love to see it. I would see, love to see what it looks like. Buddhist centers, you know, every other block, or uh, I don't know what form it's going to take, but there will be a time when uh, Buddhism will be... The, the main religious tradition in this culture. And I hope that Zen is a part of it. I hope that Shin Buddhism is a part of it as well. So, as, as they say in Japanese, you know, Gambari Masho, <laughs> let's, let's, let's uh, work hard together in this next 100 years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want to come on up? Ito Sensei, why don't you sit here? We're going to have a discussion now. Here, why don't you? Put you over here. <laughs> and um, we want to welcome Duncan. You, you don't know this if you're not here, but um, Duncan just got here. His plane was delayed. And so welcome, welcome, Duncan. Um, let me start off by just asking a question to Duncan. And I mean a question, but the reason... Of course, um, I thought about Duncan coming here. Yeah. Since he's not on the camera. Oh, okay, okay. We'll, we'll move it. We'll move it. Move it. Yeah, we'll move it. But um, the reason Duncan um, is so perfect for this, not only because he's a brilliant scholar of Buddhism, but I remember when I first met him a long time ago, you might not remember this, up in Berkeley, I asked Duncan because I was interested in Zen, and I said, I, Duncan, you're a scholar, but you're a Zen priest or... You, you know, what do you think of, I come from a Jyoro Shinshu background, what's the connection between Jyoro Shinshu and Zen? And Duncan just offhandedly says, we all start out Zen, but we all end up Jyoro Shinshu. <laughs> <laughs> because we think we can do it on our own, and then we give up. But thank you, Duncan, for coming in. And uh, so, Shingon Buddhism in the middle. <laughs> there you go. There you go.
I'm, I'm so sorry. First of all, to long as an organizer of an event, when a, somebody, a panelist doesn't turn up on time, <laughs> it's very stressful. I'm sorry, I had a flight, I was supposed to be here by noon, but my flight was canceled, oh, and so rerouted, and then delayed, and then I thought, and then I thought the event was at six. So anyway, <laughs> my fault altogether, and my apologies. Uh, half apologies, I heard half of your talk, and full apologies. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know what you said. So it's a somewhat odd moment for me, having not known exactly what you said, to, to, to do a conversation about uh, uh, Zen and Shin. But I kind of maybe want to start with Marvin. Uh, Nori, please come in. You know, because I, I think you started with that um, to study the Buddha way uh, is to study the self. But I want to go to the next lines because I think that's how we get a little bit more uh, clarity. To study the self is to forget the self, right, in the Japanese. And then to forget the self is to be affirmed or, you know, actualized by the 10,000 things, right? So everything in the world. Uh, and then and, and it goes on, but I feel like let's at least try to go into those two second and third lines because there's something about I think certain forms of Zen practice that is not about like grasping and attaining actual you know uh, some kind of uh, thing that's other than yourself, some enlightenment that's outside of yourself, but rather it's it's about opening the hand and releasing and letting go so that the Buddha nature that's already there can shine properly. And that's to be, and the actualized, I feel like that's also suggesting to us in the way that uh, uh, Reverend you mentioned, like that, that line between self and other is actually pretty fuzzy. Everything we are, everything, you know, when we investigate the self, but also when we investigate the path, you know, it's also, as we say, everything's interpenetrating each other, uh, our identities, our, our very being. And so I, I kind of want to start maybe with kind of like understanding. Of, so, so I think there's a certain way in which us as Zen practitioners, we, we all, I think, start with, you know, oh, I'm going to get enlightenment or I'm going to try practice hard to do X or Y or Z accomplish and until a point, whether it's in a session or whether it's in a, when we start to release and let go. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about not the theory of being a Shin Buddhist practitioner, but the actual lived experience of practicing and deepen, deepening practice. Is it that we just are doing it from a different vantage point or reversed way where the presumption and pre predicate is release, let go, you know, we have it on, uh, like our, our ego self, we can release it. And then we rely on, I mean, other, 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 and then, but what is the deepening of that, you know, beyond the kind of theoretical frame? And maybe we could just start there to kind of start delving a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, the Schindler's life, maybe much like Zen, there's this struggle and tension. You know, it's not just, like I just leave it up to you know me that kind of thing, and uh, there are some wonderful stories about some of the Shin Buddhist Myokoni, mm. and there's one that uh, he was you know an intense seeker, listening, and was so got to the point where so frustrated, nailed his obutsudan shut. Mm. You know the Shin Buddhist, you go before your obutsudan every day, you pay respect to the Buddha, and so he's trying to you know, understand this, the heart of the Buddha. And he's, and he's struggling with it and just oh, kind of frustrated and nails his open stone shut, you know, and maybe reaches a point of you know, very deep frustration, but then, you know, doesn't stop there, continues to seek and then just some insight comes in. And then maybe now he opens the, the doors again and has even deeper kind of connection and appreciation mm -hmm. of, of Buddha and himself. And so, uh, you know, a lot of teachers and people I've known, there's always been this, you know, they're, they're seeking, they're struggling, maybe no different than a Zen person sitting, trying to awaken oneself, you know, but there's, there's teachers and teachings that emerge that, that give you insight, 
show you maybe the but the falseness of, of your approach of, of striving. But you can't get anywhere without striving either. So there's this contradiction of seeking and also being awakened by truth that seems to me to occur. So in the context of Sangha practice, yeah, like that, yeah, right? yeah. Where, where the deepening mm -hmm. might be like others are mirrors to us, that kind of metaphor, mm -hmm. right? That, mm -hmm. that, that it's in Sangha that we see ourselves mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the other people are like the mirrors. Right. Right. But that also kind of presumes a certain idea of like, where is the Buddha located, right? And I just want to kind of probe a little bit about, and, and Nori, please come in on this as well. Like, there's a famous story, you know, the Yoshisaki here, like there was that story when he was like a young novice monk, you know, going first to the monastery and he was asked, uh, along with two other little kids, I guess, you know, it wasn't unusual in the Japan at that time, you're 10 years old, 11, 12, 13, to go into monastery. And so he was having the first meeting with his Zen teacher and he was given a question, I mean, tea, and then mm -hmm. the question in front of the teacher. And he was asked, uh, uh, how old is the Buddha? Uh -huh. And the kid next to him said, the Buddha is 2,500 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next kid said, the Buddha is uh, timeless. Mm -hmm. And then Joshu Sasaki said, the Buddha is 13. <laughs> okay. It's three different, it's not that any of those, but, but the Zen teacher was like, he, this kid's got some, he's seen something about how the Buddha is not far away, right? In Juru Shinshu, you get this kind of like, at least theologically, mm -hmm. the Buddha is far away in the West, somewhere called the West of Pure Land. And it's the other, it's not yourself, it's the other. And yet, we talk about others helping to awaken, get insights, and so on. I'm not sure exactly where I'm going with this question, but, but you see what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. where is the Buddha? Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, that's why I, mean, I think, you know, in what we're encouraged to do is not to look for the Buddha in the mm -hmm. but look for the Buddha right in front of you. Right. And so you see that you can see Buddha like, you know, things and people right. or in experiences. Right. 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 And then, you know, Amida Buddha is, uh, immeasurable light mm. and immeasurable life. Mm. So I often think of Amida Buddha not as this kind of Buddha being, but, right. but uh, the light of the Dharma, mm. you know, the light of the Dharma that penetrates into the darkness of our hearts or uh, sort of a true life. Mm. When we live a really true, sincere life, that's Amida Buddha. Uh, What's the relationship in your minds between, let's say, thinking about the Buddha and kind of, I don't want to use the word abstract, because mm -hmm. that makes it sound almost negative, at least in, I think, our traditions, right? Uh, maybe in some Buddhist traditions, abstraction is actually okay. Mm -hmm. But I feel like we tend to think about Buddhist practice as intimate, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, 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 and not theoretical, abstract. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and yet, Light is abstract, mm -hmm. you know, infinite light, you know, mm -hmm. these type of terms. But and, and but yet it's uh, terms that are very suggestive and profound that it's not contained. And yet we have this kind of, how should we say? It? So I, I, I'm trying to, I, I want to get into the question of like, what is the relationship between that which we can't even speak about because it's beyond our comprehension, beyond our ability, beyond our, you know, frameworks of regular conventional things and that's the buddha but also the intimate of 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 buddhist practice and, and touching the ground of the, you know is is found in some a word that your wife might say or it, uh, that your dog acts up like like you see the buddha in in so many intimate ways mm -hmm. And yet it can't be, and, and so, so I'm, you know, and I feel like Christians have this issue too, right? Is it a God that is so profound? And yet is it a intimate personal God that where you have a personal intimate connection with, and it's only through that intimate that you really experience salvation. That kind of thing. And I wonder in the Shin Buddhist tradition, how you think of 
you know, because like in, you know, it, it may be more like jizo kan, like we, you know, like bodhisattvas, and we tend to feel that that kind of intimate, like this jizo, this but like at this temple, this moment, you know, where we make our karmic connection or something. What is the karmic connection to Amida Buddha? Like, how do you think about that in the both kind of that most profound way, but also in the most intimate way? No, I think that it, it, is, uh, it is exactly that. It's like Amida, you know, uh, the image of Amida, not the image, but the, the, the being of Amida. <laughs> and being able to see Amida in, in ourselves and in each other. And so it's, uh, on the one hand, it's kind of like, you know, uh, almost inconceivable. But on the other hand, it's an everyday, uh, <laughs> so everyday teaching. Right. So. I was going to say that I think I think it becomes intimate when we connect with it through people. Mm -hmm. uh, I can I mentioned Reverend Kusada at, mm -hmm. at IBS, and when I was at IBS, uh, my grandmother passed away, so I had to go back home for my grandmother's funeral. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I told Reverend Kusada I have to be gone for a few days, and my grandmother passed away. And you know how most People, even I as a minister, oh, very sorry to hear about your grandmother. But Reverend Kusada, I mean, it's almost like his heart just came out of his being and just enveloped my heart. He said, oh, you know, I'm, I can't even imitate yeah. him. Well, he's just so sincere right. and his sort of empathy, like that, this, this, is, this right. is what the heart of compassion is. This right. Is, so you kind of sense it in those kind of two people like that. Right, 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 right. Can I ask you, like, you know, I have the, these days I've been doing this. How do you strip Buddhism down to very uh, uh, concise, kind of brevity, like concise way, like writing poetry, trying mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. sh short the words down. Mm -hmm. So I had this kind of wisdom times compassion equals freedom. That's kind of like baseline for mm -hmm. thinking about what is our Buddhist practice all about, that either it's about free, like liberation, but in America, I feel like we should use freedom because then nobody can reject. But, 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 but the idea that we have lots of different styles of practice in our lineages, right? But that they're oriented towards either helping us shift perspective, right? take things that we're, we're stuck in a rut or a way of thinking, like, and just open up a possibility, right? That, 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 that we might term wisdom, right? Some, something with a term, it's a term. And, and we have many in our Zen tradition of turning words and turning phrases, different things that can shift, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes just a little shift in our lives, we're like oppressed by something and we just open our hands a little bit and see past it and like, oh, a different vantage point helps us see something and you get a little bit freer, right? But that story you just told uh, about about the, just the pure feeling of the heart of compassion, of the feeling that we are in this mountain of suffering, but we're in it together, and that we're on this pathway to that, that sharing of that feeling. That's a powerful, powerful thing too. Then that's beyond maybe even our minds and our ability to perspective and all that kind of thing. And, but I think in Zen, we have a certain way of, as you say, either entering or balancing, or you know, sometimes we have this and we kind of add that, or it's sometimes it's additive, sometimes it's multiplicative, sometimes it's subtracting. Like we do different things in our practice, I think, where sometimes it's about wisdom and sometimes it's about compassion, but both are ultimately about freedom. And I wonder if you can maybe, sorry to put you into that frame, but like if you had to kind of talk about Shin Buddhist practice and how you, you know, practice and within your sanghas, how, what is that balance between wisdom and compassion? Well, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, we have, to, we have to keep both concepts in mind, you know, on a regular basis. And, and, and uh, you know, it, it's it's not so much like whether I'm acting in a wise way or act passionately, but being able to you know recognize the compassion of others, mm -hmm. 
uh, the wisdom of others, and and uh, uh, know that you know I have so much more to learn, continue to learn, and uh, <laughs> uh, it's Dr. Noble Haneda, uh, you know, sort of Shin Buddhist right. teacher. So he he always says, you know, wisdom is what liberates us. Mm -hmm. you know, wisdom is what liberates us. But this uh, receiving of wisdom is compassion. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I used to hear other teachers say, well, Zen emphasizes wisdom, Shin Buddhism emphasizes compassion. But I, I think it's all wisdom, but the receiving of the wisdom is, is compassion. Or in, in our case, sharing of the Dharma is is really compassion. We're trying to uh, share the wisdom of the Dharma. I didn't hear what you said, so I'm at, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm at a deficit. If you had to, in thirty seconds, like what was what was what was the main? Um, yeah, I don't agree. With that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think that uh, one of the things that you know I was trying to uh, emphasize is, uh, you know, like evaluating myself on an everyday kind of basis, and uh, uh, and then and then looking at others and and uh, you know re realizing that I have so much further to go to be a person like this person. And it, sometimes even my wife. <laughs> yeah. But uh, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It, it, sometimes you, you know, like you feel like uh, you're acting compassionately, but then that's such an arrogant way of looking at right. it. Your actions, right? Right, right. And so it's, it, you know, Shinan, you know, his, his whole point was that uh, he's just an ordinary, uh, un, you know, uh, ignorant person, right? And, uh, uh, and, but then he would see the wisdom and the compassion in others, mm -hmm. but he wouldn't, he couldn't see it in himself. Mm -hmm. And it's that kind of uh, self exception that, uh, you know, it, it, that makes us into better people, right? Right. Can, can I yeah. get in here? We do. It's 15 minutes to go, and we want to have some questions. Please. But can I let me let me start the questions? This is long talking. This is a wonderful opportunity. We have the Bishop of Higashi Honganji, the Bishop of Nishi Honganji here, and I'm wondering. We're talking about Zen and Shin, but I'm wondering about Shin and Shin, about institutional divides and and differences, and how you two. Just like merge Zen and Shin, how do you merge Higashi and Nishi or manage that divide? <laughs> <laughs> it's like you could never make the Clippers and the Lakers one basketball team. I said he's same sport. <laughs> Some would stand very rigidly on the tradition of we're Nishi or we're Higashi. But I was, uh, I learned under wonderful Higashi teachers too, like Reverend Kubose. I love the writings of uh, Reverend Akegaras, who was a Higashi uh, Honganji minister. Uh, and so I, I kind of have this appreciation for both traditions. And I would hope that Higashi ministers would uh, study uh, Nishi Honganji writers and thinkers too. So, What have you learned? Uh, I'm sure there are people in your congregations or Nishi yeah. Honganji who don't have that type of openness. Right, right. What have right. you learned from, uh, maybe you can't convert them, but what have you learned uh, about human nature from those types? Of well, I would just, uh, you know, I don't <laughs> let it kind of bother me, but I just uh, continue to appreciate both traditions. And then even some would say, oh, we're Shinshu, we're not Zen. And they would look kind of negatively towards the study uh, of of Zen, but there too, uh, I've met many Shin teachers who meditated every day and had great appreciation for Zen. There is a Obakushu Zen minister whose spiritual experience was Jodo Shinshu, <laughs> and he was criticized by Zen for being too 
Jodu Shinshu like, you know. So uh, sometimes you can have sort of sectarian Buddhism, and we have to kind of get beyond sectarian Buddhism and really try to come to the core. Yeah, uh, you know, I, uh, my mother and my father both were uh, born in temples. My mother had like eight brothers and sisters. And uh, she was born in a Higashi temple, but then several of her brothers and sisters married into Nishi temples or you know, were adopted into Nishi temples. And uh, so when we get together, we uh, always kind of like laugh at each other and say, oh, your chanting is so slow. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all in good fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we love each other, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, we point out the differences. <laughs> I often think like it's kind of like almost like a sociology of religion framework, you know, when people are, let's say you live in a small town and it's like you and there's somebody from Tibetan Buddhism and there's only a few Buddhists around. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to get along mm -hmm. because you're like, mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. but then when you have like a very, you know, concentrated place where there's a lot of pride in one yeah. lineage or another, yeah. sectarian or otherwise, then everything from like, you know, even within like Soto Zen Buddhism, like it's already a pretty small sub sub of a sub sub. We have like Eheji and Sojiji style. Like, do you turn to the left or right? Like, there's little ceremonial things that do become big deals. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. in those type of very particular smaller contexts. But then when we think broader, yeah. it really doesn't, yeah. it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. You know? it's, we are, uh, you know, uh, U.S. Homeland is much smaller than USDA, and so like our temples, uh, the, the young people are able to join in, you know, the the, uh, the league, the, you know, the Southern District and things like that. And uh, so, but then you know, our kids are always kind of have a, a inferiority complex. We're, we're much smaller, and and when I when I would take the kids to Japan, and uh, there is this one uh, thing where we go up on the roof. And we could see, you know, Kyoto, and see Nishomanji, you know, from from that vantage point, and then they all say, "Wow, Nishi looks so small." <laughs> Are there questions um, from the audience here, or certainly if you're on Zoom, feel free to use the chat. Yes, there it was. Actually, it's. For Duncan, but you brought up um, where you were hopeful and you were curious what Buddhism was going to look like uh -huh. in the near future. Yeah. yeah. And you know, in celebration of a hundred years, does that look like a hundred years? Yeah. You know, uh -huh. Duncan, I was curious your perspective on that thought as well. Where, how does this go from here? Does it expand? Does it contract? Is mm -hmm. it? What, what's the what's what's the projection in your mind? Well, I think one of the features here in LA, particularly in terms of the present and the future, is that we have for the first time in Buddhist history, 2,500 years of it, every single lineage in one city. Mm -hmm. You can, can't go to mm -hmm. Shanghai or Bangkok or Kyoto mm -hmm. and find Laotian Buddhists right, rubbing, rubbing up against, you know, Sri Lankan Theravada Buddhists and Mahayana and Vajra, you know, everybody's here, which means that, that that the diversity of the Buddhist traditions allow for more, in, you know, in Buddhist history, there's also Buddhist and non you know, Buddhism and Taoism, or Buddhism and Bun in, in Tibet, or Shinto in Japan. But within Buddhism, these encounters tend to produce new ways of teaching, new ways of ritual, and new ways of Sangha or community. And I bet that. The, the hopeful note that you sounded has to do with some of the innovative things that will happen kind of organically, mm. right? And innovative combinations, innovative work. And I think that's one of the, you know, challenges of thinking about a hundred years is that on the one hand, things that do tend to go a hundred years or 200 years, you don't want too much innovation, right? <laughs> you need to also have some sensibility about what what should be you know maintained yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and that there's a kind of pride in maintaining that style mm -hmm. that you know that ancestors have, mm -hmm. you know have, have been doing the same thing so that balance of kind of like the rubbing up against innovating transforming is the hopeful thing but also trying to figure out what are the, some of the things that we are really you know keen on maintaining as well it's almost like churning butter where you need to the top eventually uh -huh. right. Thank you. Any other? Yeah. yeah. So, another question you have, right? Uh, I see Frederick has his hand up. Frederick, can you uh, articulate your question? Yes. Not so much a question. First, I'm so delighted with this discussion and everything, but I wanted to bring up a, a story that I had heard that supposedly Shinron and Dogen met each other and came to a great deal of respect. And, Shinron gave Dogen his ojuzu beads, and uh, Dogen gave Shinron his, uh, I guess, fly whisk, which I gather is a uh, symbol of um, Zen practice or authority. And uh, about a couple of weeks ago, I actually discovered a picture of a statue of Shinron with both in hand at one of the uh, non Hunganji uh, temples in the Jodo Shinshu tradition. So I think this story or this example is of. Uh, illustrative of how Shin and Zen can meet and share and discuss with each other and, and recognize the validity of what each is doing. Any thoughts about the historical? I think his, his question was whether Shinran and Dogit met each other. Oh. And then he's heard some, there's a picture of, of Shinran holding like a Zen religious items, so maybe they met, but maybe Duncan... I know, I have not personally ever, uh, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're, they're I, you know, they lived in the same milieu, right? right, right. They, they were in the same uh, uh, decades of uh, thinking in Japan, where it wasn't just that, there were quite a few innovative thinkers of that time, and uh, so whether they actually met or not, legend or uh, reality, I think the idea that uh, this was a period, their period, was one where a lot of new energy, movement, and thinking about both what to do with Mapo, the kind of degenerate age of the Dharma theory kind of that was prevalent at that time. They came up with slightly different answers to that, uh, how to deal with that. Uh, but uh, this idea of like, uh, kind of like, if this is the last, thing what are you going to say mm. what is the what is the form and style of buddhist practice and we're gonna we're gonna kind of put all our eggs in you know and and i think they were kind of confronted with that and they came up with slightly different styles but they but i think they shared that energy it wasn't a time when it was all very very flat it was a very dynamic time in buddhist uh, thinking and life and and interacting between different people of different uh, uh, lineages of Buddhism. And so whether that actual incident happened or not, I don't know. But uh, it's not surprising that people were influenced by each other. Final questions? Online? Duncan, do you have a one last question? Sure. Well, you know, so one of the things, for example, in the Zen tradition, we have uh, different metaphors about, like in sort of like Tozan Goi, like five ranks of Tozan, and five different ways to see reality, or, uh, you know, very famous, like 10 ox herding pictures mm -hmm. is one kind of like visual representation of a certain idea of both the path and the kind of walking that path and different facets of it but also they're not even necessarily like you go from a to b and that's the path of you know but but they're kind of facets of it and there are facets of zen buddhist life in the things like the ten ox that's about you got to find that ox you got to find you got to find yourself you got to master yourself you got to write it you got to you know then, but then there's that release and then there's the emptiness and then there's the flowers that come through and the, the, the you know it, and it's about different facets and positionalities of 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 of, of a zen buddhist practice life and i wonder if maybe you could share if 
because you know and, but then there's this kind of like other idea which is that there is no stages there is no uh, facets there is no right that's our kind of mahana buddhist world is that we have the kind of no 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 these are artifices and whatever and then we have this kind of like imagined world right because i feel like the power of buddhism has to both to do with the let's call it majamaka kind of negation theory like things we thought were real oh it's actually not true they're not really so and we can therefore let go of some fantasy that we were holding in our minds our delusions and so so there's a kind of no tradition and the yoga chara is mm -hmm. that's like your mind can create possibility in anything including buddha worlds mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and so that's another powerful impulse within our buddhist stream is to be able to imagine and see something hope and possibility and maybe and then to me a lot of the, those kind of stages is about like sometimes it's about negation and sometimes it's about imagination i wondered if you have in your traditions any kind of metaphors or images about either the kind of like uh path or the negation side of it or the the, or the imagination side of it. I wonder if that's something you could, you could kind of relate to or touch, uh, touch on. Well, the, neg you know, the negation side is a, a very, what do you call it, important part of shame. <laughs> it's like looking at oneself and you know, right. just realizing that you know, I'm so far away. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then seeing, you know, seeing you know, my good, good people. Right. You know, Right. <laughs> I, I, I was just thinking the Shinra's words, you know, Nembu Su Jobu Su So it's just it's just through the Nembu Su we become Buddha. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, that might occur suddenly, it might occur gradually. Right. Or it's it's this sort of lifelong mm. process. Right, uh, right, uh, right, uh, right, right. Last uh, question, Nembutsu, because uh, Neng, <laughs> I feel like in the, you know, older tradition, in Sanskrit and then in Chinese Buddhism, was really about visualization. You, you it's, that, mm -hmm. it links to that tradition of, of imagining mm -hmm. the Buddha is no longer here, <clears throat> the absent Buddha is made present again, right? Through Vi vi visualizing, right? But at some point, mm -hmm. it's like a mantra, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Nembutsu is, is is the is the bringing into the present mm -hmm. the Buddha through through voice, mm -hmm. and we have many other like Shingon and other traditions of voicing mm -hmm. and the power of mantra to 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 do that. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could say a little something about like the power of you know in our organization we also do chanting we also do mantras and stuff but if you could tell speak to a little bit about like um come from vision to to voicing what is what is the movement there what's the power there that uh, you feel in your tradition well i think you know like in old, old, uh, older days you know, more uh, long ago yeah. <clears throat> Uh, especially like the simple people, the farmers, and you know, the, 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 just the townspeople, uh, were encouraged by their priests to say numbers, you know, th throughout their day, mm -hmm. all day, and and uh, you know, and I, I, you, I remember like he hearing uh, people say that, uh, you know, at the Hunza, mm -hmm. you you know, it not uh, it's like women who telling me this, but you go into a bathroom. And you hear these obachans just reciting the numbers mm. as they're taking care of their business. <laughs> <laughs> and then and it's like, you know, it, it's like, they, it's almost like they can't help it. It just naturally flows. Mm. 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 And, but it's more females than males. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so, I was just going to say, I think that Chinese pure land master, Shandao, yes. Zendo, is the one who changed it from a visual right. nimbutsu to a recitation. recitation. But our, for all practical purposes, 
we were we didn't really have any of that visualization part mm -hmm. of it mm -hmm. in in our temples. You know, it's it's right. all been just saying the memories. Right, 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 right. But I, mean, I, I did mention about like Holman, you know, he he uh, he he was said to say the numbers ten thousand times a day. A day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. But China didn't pick up on that. Right, right, right. His right. 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 was more sincere numbers rather than right numbers. Right, the intention behind it. Well, all right, well, let's yeah. have a long uh, <laughs> close this up. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Um, so I just want to thank you all. We're going to end right here. Um, and Toho Sensei is going to close us out. But please stick with us uh, next month where we have uh, our talk is going to be called Growing Up Sheen. Or, I'm sorry, Growing Up Zen. <laughs> And we have two <laughs> wonderful speakers who were raised in Zen centers here in America. And Jose Kwong from Sonoma Mountain Zen Center and Yoko Okamura, whose father, Shohaku Okamura, uh, you know, was, is a well-known Soto Zen um, teacher in the U.S. So, Tolu Sensei, please. <laughs>、okay. Now this concludes the, today's lecture. Uh, thank you for your participation. So please put your hand together and gas show. Namukie butsu. Namukie ho. Namukie so. Arigatou Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.